think back of the time when house music started, which were the famous places, if it was Chicago, New York, London, Manchester, what was, what was important? The thing with house music in the, in, in the UK is it really started in the north. Um, the North traditionally likes the faster rhythms, okay, and, and the house rhythms were um, 120 BPM plus. Okay, so um, in, in a way, in the, in the mid-80s, <clears throat> what happened is the normal music scene got, got kind of splintered. You had um, uh, kind of 10 years before, you, you had disco, you had jazz funk uh, and funk, right, and everybody danced to everything. Okay, by the by the mid '80s, you started getting slight splits in the scene. So you you know uh, when the early rap records came out, you'd have some people that went along the direction of just wanting to hear rap, and then you had um, uh, electro, which was another thing again, an awful lot of dancers doing all that kind of you know stuff, uh, and then you had mainstream sort of soul music, and so what happened is the scene was dividing almost you know organically right and um when house came along it, it it was almost the equivalent of there was a similar impact to the impact that punk had on rock music in in uh, in 1976 10 years before more or less when house music came along it was it was all about kind of mainly rhythms on cheap machines you know, um, Roland 303s, 404s, 808s, and um, it, 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 was all, it, it, was, it was the sort of dance music equi equivalent to punk, okay, because these guys were making these records in, the bed in their bedrooms in Chicago. Chicago, uh, a, 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 again, is, a, is quite an insular city. It's always developed its own, its own sort of sounds, right? Um, and prides itself on that kind of thing. But this was so different from the traditional sort of Chicago sound. It was, um, I think, probably Frankie Knuckles' influence. Frankie Knuckles went from Paradise Garage in New York to the warehouse in Chicago, and he brought that sort of New York mentality to Chicago. And then, once he was in Chicago, he got a taste for, for, for what they wanted. And what they wanted was kind of you know, up-tempo, very brutal, uh, very um, in-your-face kind of rhythms. And so kids used to, you know, make, make records at home and then bring them down to, to Frankie on, a, on, on like a cassette, <laughs> right? And uh, Frankie would play these at, at the warehouse. And all of a sudden, you've got records like... Uh, the, the perfect example is Steve Silk Hurley's Jack Your Body, um, mainly because that stole the riff from First Choice, Let No Man Put Asunder, which was in the, you know, big, big kind of dance record in the, in the late 70s. And all that happened is these Chicago guys heard that record and thought, hmm, we really like that. Like that. And, and so they built everything around that riff. Um, and quite a few of those early records you, you could hear things that they'd borrowed from. Sometimes it might be a little, you know, a little riff. Uh, but all to, really, if you think about it, it was most of the, the early house records were done on, on four-track home recording equipment. Um, and with four tracks, uh, you, you're limited. These were not polished works of art. These were dirty, brutal uh, dance rhythms. Uh, and when they came into the UK, Nobody knew what to make, the, make of them at first because we were used to more sophisticated records with lots of orchestration and proper musicians. All of a sudden, these records came in that were, damn, it sounds like a demo. It sounds like somebody messed around with some drum machines. Um, and then really, in answer to your question, that the house thing was beginning. I, I, at the time, I was working for a label called Serious Records, um, and so I was right in the, in the middle of the, the whole house thing exploding. In fact, we were the first company to put out Steve Silk Hurley, Jack Your Body in the UK. Um, and then because of the success of that, because that was the number one record, and that kind of came out of nowhere. Uh, but really, it was, it, it was kind of coming from the north of England. Graham Park, um, especially uh, DJ at the Blue Note in Derby, 
he was very instrumental and, and influential in, um, in in breaking house music in the UK. Then he had the Hacienda uh, in Manchester, where again there was a, a, a good good energy going on. And so when, whenever I think of where house really started, I remember going around the country at the time promoting albums, and um, I'd go at the M1 out of London, get to Derby go see Graham Park play at the Blue Note, and it was amazing. It was like, this guy's playing nothing but house, and the kids are going crazy to it. And then, I'd, you know, we got to Leeds, and then over to Manchester. Colin Curtis was doing a club called The Playmate. And again, this is Manchester, and Manchester generally, um, a lot of these guys were into rap, and it was very, very strange, because you'd see these, um, Manchester's a, quite a hard place and so you had gangs so you had Cheatham Hill gang Moss Side gang so you'd have all these these um, dangerous guys and they were all nodding away to house it's like normally you'd expect to see them smoking a spliff listening to some rap or reggae but this was like fast paced house music so that's when we kind of knew there's a real groundswell um, coming up and then uh, I've got to say that um, London uh, then started catching up. You had people like Jazzy M, uh, who was very uh, in, in influential in it. And it, it but I, th I think the single key thing was that Steve Silk Hurley record, uh, Jack Your Body, and then Love Can't Turn Around, Farley Jack Master Funk. Um, these were two pop hits in the UK. So the minute that sound um, hit number one, it meant every pop DJ in the country was playing it suddenly house was hip and then it was like a it was like a tidal wave then and then it was almost everywhere you went was playing house, house music this would be by about 88 89 when when the the there was a real explosion going on so it's a it, it's kind of fascinating and once again it split the scene again okay because now you had people that just wanted to hear house they didn't want to hear slow 106 BM, ppm stuff they didn't want to hear jazz um they didn't particularly want to hear acid jazz uh, they, they they wanted to hear those house rhythms especially out of chicago and then house itself mutated because then you had the detroit guys that were doing the uh, what they call techno okay slightly more aggressive industrial detroity <laughs> you know type of type of rhythms uh, and then from all that, then you had the New Jersey sound, which again took the house, you know, took the house tempo uh, and just slightly made it more sophisticated. And Thuz Garage was born. So, it, right, essentially, house then started mutating in the same way that the music had previously. And so you had all these different strands of house, you know, then you had soulful house, deep house, hard house, this house, that house. <laughs> like a spider's web. Really diverse, right. Um, and you described the, the audience from Manchester, but like in general, what was the, uh, the house music audience look like? Kind of... Young people on drugs. That's what they look like. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, the other thing is that the explosion in house music also coincided with... Um, the mass consumption of E. Okay, this is when the UK uh, discovered the, um, uh, the uh, I guess, dance floor benefits or the, the energy benefits of, uh, of taking E. And so you had this incredible situation where uh, that's kind of also when a lot of underground parties started. Um, you, you know, you couldn't really go into an established club in, in, in the West End of London, for instance, and expect to play six hours of, of, of non-stop house because, you know, the audience was too diverse and everything. So what happened is these, these warehouse parties started cropping up. Um, and I guess, yeah, around about 80, 87, 88, 89 was, you know, gem generally there would be something going on Every Saturday night, there'd be like a, um, a grapevine that, that you know you 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 know where are you going on Saturday? Oh, there's some there's some do going on in West London called Westworld. Oh yeah, right. You turn up and there'd be like four or five thousand people there, 
and the soundtrack was House. And it was a very, it was an incredibly exciting time. It really was. There was, you know, there, there was lots going on. Uh, and, and this was echoed around the country, really. There were a lot of, uh, this was, in, in a way, the beginning of the rave um, generation, okay? But, but really, in 80, 80, 87, 88, 89, uh, it was house music that drove what, what I would call the, the dance music revolution of the 90s where you got the superstar DJs then and, and everything. The, 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 the house music was the, the link, you know, um, and, uh, and it, it just a lot of circumstances happened at the right time. Um, the, uh, the government, um, I, think, I think Thatcher was in power then, uh, and they were trying to inhibit, you know, mass gatherings, anything that the government couldn't control, they didn't like. Uh, and so you, you would get these these incredible parties. Sometimes they, they'd stop motorways, right? Because so many people were going there. So they'd have something on, usually around the M25, which is the circular motorway around London, right? They'd choose venues that were easy to, to get to by car, right? And sometimes you'd have secret instructions. We, we were talking about this the other day. Uh, you'd have these secret instructions where you'd have a phone number to ring. You'd call the number, and the num the, the the message on on the thing would say, "Right, go to so and so, so and so," and you'll get the instructions then where to go. It's almost like make it secret, and and it's got this bit of mystique to it. And then you'd end up driving out into the country somewhere in the middle of nowhere, and there'd be five thousand kids there, and there'd be strobes, lights, you know, booming sound system and um, a euphoric atmosphere. And so all this was going on. I mean, Britain is traditionally quite a reserved country. And um, uh, we had a particular summer, I think it might have been the summer of 88 or, or thereabouts, where it seemed like the country was on the edge of some sort of dance floor <laughs> revolution, really, you know, like, like simply because these things were springing up and the authorities they were always one step ahead. The authorities would bust one place, and then the next week there'd be another completely, you know, completely different venue going on somewhere else. And and some of these things were run by organised crime as well. So, so was was the same kind of a reaction against the Thatcher politics at that time? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. It it, it was actually quite political, um, and. It, 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 any attempt, really, uh, um, by the governments to censor uh, the uh, the youth in the UK is usually met with some kind of opposition. But this was, I think, there was genuine concern. No, nobody knew what the long-term effects of ecstasy would be. Um, some people, uh, un unfortunately, passed away, like you know, you get with any kind of drug usage. Um, and I just had the feeling that in the summer of '88. Uh, the government might have felt like it was it was losing control, in a way. As it happened, it's it's just another part of youth. It, it's it's exactly the same as in the sixties, um, when um, you know the, the the clubs like the Scene and the Twisted Wheel in in, in the north, they were the kind of the cool places to go. In the seventies, you had the whole jazz funk. Uh, and disco explosion, and you know, in the mid 70s for that generation, those were the cool places to go. The mid 80s to the the uh, uh, to 1990, virtually that last five years of that decade was laid the the foundations for everything after that. You know, and, and um, really had this incredible audience. I mean, the numbers were were pretty huge. You could you could sell. Routinely, 20,000, 30,000 of a 12-inch house record, if you had a good one, you know, so you could, you, you could you'd just put them out and there'd be 15,000, 20,000 people out there that wanted it. It, 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 it kind of um, electrified a lot of people. A lot of kids were coming into it as well. So if you're a 17, 18-year-old kid and you're looking at all these DJs and everything, and you're thinking, yeah, all right, this is really cool. You'd be in the shop two, three times a week to listen to the uh, the new stuff. So it was a real, it was a, it was a boom time. And, and funnily enough, as far as I'm concerned, it was the 
uh, it was the the best, uh, the the last really good time, in my opinion. Right, I, 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 in the nineties, everything became too commercialised. Um, dance music was selling itself out. Really, the records weren't any good. But that period um, was like a really, it was like a wake up call. Um, the only <clears throat> the only thing that actually held house back uh, was it was eventually there was just kind of maybe too many mediocre records and not enough good ones. But the good house anthems have, have, have stood up. But, um, I mean, here this weekend at Baltic, um, I was hearing Promised Land, Joe Smooth, right? But somebody's done a new version of that. So, so house was, that was a really good period and some great records were, you know, came through it. Definitely, yeah. I agree. Um, would, you, would you call um, house music game music? Uh, <clears throat> I think it. I think it was pretty gay in Chicago. Um, the funny thing, when those guys first came to the UK, uh, I I actually picked them up at the airport. So I met Rocky Jones, who ran DJ International, Louis Pitsley, who was his front man, uh, and they brought in Farley Jack Master Funk, and um, Farley Jack Master Funk was was, was gay. And he was wearing, you know, kind of spandex type of stuff in like Louis Vuitton handbags. And I'm like, wow, I, I, you know, I didn't realise. But he was over the top gay, right? And then a uh, couple of months later, uh, we got the Bam Bam record, um, Give It To Me, which was a huge, huge house hit. And we were the first on it. And we did a deal with Bam Bam uh, and said, look, do you want to come over to the UK to... Uh, to help promote the record. <coughs> so Bam Bam got on the flight to the UK, and the very first gig that we had uh, was up in Manchester at the Playmate, at this, you know, kind of city centre club where you had the Moss Side, the Hume Hill gangs, uh, you know, all converging on this one club. Some real heavy characters there. And this was going to be Bam Bam's first PA in the UK. And it, everything was so rushed. He flew in, we jumped in a car, we drove up to Manchester, checked in the hotel, got to get to the gig. I had no, no time to ask him, what's your, what do you do exactly? I just assumed, you know, we put the record on in, or put a tape of the instrumental on. And Bam Bam's like, don't worry, don't worry, man. I got a whole show together. You're not going to believe it when you see me perform. I'm like, okay, okay. You know, the guy seems to know what he's doing. Uh, and so... Um, he, uh, he's like, where's the dressing room? I'm like, dressing room? What, what, what are you going to, what, have you got a stage outfit? He's like, oh yeah, man, I've got a stage outfit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm like, okay, we sorted him out. He went in the dressing room, and then it's like five minutes before he's due to come out, and um, I kind of knocked on the door, said, um, are you ready, Bam Bam? He said, yeah, 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 come in, man, come in. And like, I went through the door, and he, he had like a, Lurex, kind of sparkly Lurex, you know, kind of uh, cat suit is the only way I can describe it. Very gay, but Bam Bam wasn't gay, but he was dressed like he was Liberace. And I'm like, man, you, you know, we better be careful out there. You know, there's some real gangbangers in that audience. And they were all at the front, just where Bam Bam was going to perform. So I, I'm like, okay, let's, you know, just, Take it easy, you know, don't upset anybody. And he's wearing this spandex thing with all this sparkly stuff. You know, he, he looked very, very gay. And so we, we, we ushered him out and there was no stage there, it was the dance floor. So everybody had to clear the dance floor. So there was just this big circle of very, very tough looking guys that were gang members. <laughs> they were like looking across the dance floor, psyching out the other gangs. And right in the middle of this, we brought Bam Bam and the record started, and um, he's in this spandex, sparkly, you know, outfit and everything. And the record's called Give It To Me. He goes, give it to me, give it to me. I'm a man, baby. I'm a man. <laughs> you know, emphasising the fact he's a man, but he looks like some kind of gay, gay thing. So anyway, it's kind of okay. The, the, these dreadlock guys are, are like looking at each other, what the hell is it? What the hell is this? <laughs> you know what I mean? He's like, what's just appeared in front of us? And so they're watching it and everything. And then the climax of the record 
And I didn't know this was going to happen, right? It gets to the bit where, where uh, I'd, I'd give it to me, give it to me, give it to me, you know, like, like that, a sort of climax thing. And he suddenly pulled this thing, and, and, and his whole um, suit came off, and he had like a, a G string, <laughs> a sparkly spandex G string, and um, he's kind of stripped off in front of all these hard guys. I thought there was going to be a riot. But it all happened so fast, you know, it's like these guys are like watching this odd thing in the first place. Then the next thing, you know, Bam Bam's dick is virtually stuck in their face. <laughs> you know what I mean? I didn't think we were, didn't think we were going to make it out of there alive. You might have to edit that for international TV. <laughs> it was, yeah, so it was weird. So there was a gay influence, without a doubt. And, and uh, there were a lot of, yeah, there were a lot of gay performers there. Again, Frankie Knuckles' influence, I think that, you know, the, the garage, um, sorry, the warehouse um, in, in uh, Chicago was like an extension of the Paradise Garage in New York. So it's mainly a black a gay audience. Um, and that's really what Frankie catered for. Mm. Frankie played the story, by the way, because I never saw pictures of that, but I just remember the record. But, uh, yeah, I'll send you pictures of him. I'll, I'll try and... Uh, he's coming over to the UK shortly. Oh, he's really? he's going to be over in a couple of weeks, I think. Yeah, wow. yeah. I spoke to him a, a little while back. I, I think he's changed his act. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but <coughs> Frankie, um, I guess, is a, is a good example for the, for the soulful house scene, mm -hmm. isn't he? Uh, absolutely, Marshall Jefferson as well. I mean, um, I mean, Frank, Frankie Knuckles is is my hero, right? I think his taste is immaculate, and I still think he makes fantastic records. He's got such a a good ear for um, for arrangement and so on. But um, I think that the one of the best records, really, of all time was um, Tears. So Frankie Knuckles, Satoshi Tommy. Uh, and Robert Owens on vocals, and when I think about Soulful House, I mean, that's, that's really the kind of house I like. So groups like Ten City, Devotion, uh, That's The Way Love Is, um, Tears, Frankie Knuckles, you know, there, was, there, there were actually some really polished, great performances. I, I listen to Tears now, and it's, as a record, I think it's in my, my, my top ten of all time. Just beautiful production. Um, C.C. Rogers, Someday. In fact, I did an album called Classic House Mastercuts that I think has the, the best selection on. <laughs> yeah. Actually, it was cool when... Uh, um, uh, was it the demon who sang uh, Someday yesterday? Say again. Someday. Someday. Last night on stage. Wasn't it the diva who was singing it? Oh, really? Was she, yeah, well, that's, that's, that's entirely possible. A, di a diva herself came from uh, that whole New Jer Jersey thing. She worked with Boy Boyd Jarvis. Um, yeah, so her roots are, are in that. I can totally, I didn't hear, I didn't see the performance, unfortunately, but I mean, yeah, that, that sounds like a, a good choice. And she was with Frankie, didn't she? Yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. Um, by the way, have you heard Frankie's remix of Hertz Blind? The new, of? The, of the Hertz new single, Blind? I don't think so, no. Have you know Hertz, the English duo? Hertz? Hertz? Uh, who had the big hit with, uh, last year with uh, Wonderful World? Wonderful World, Wonderful Life, Wonderful Life, Hertz. H-U-R-S-T. Sorry, man. Oh, you must know that. They are so huge. I'm 58 years old. I don't oh. listen to pop music anymore, thank you. Anyway, <laughs> Frankie Knuckles just released the release of their recent single. Okay. And is it dynamite? It's, it sounds like 15 years ago. It's got the piano line. It's, got the, yeah. it's just wonderful. It's brilliant. Well, I, I, I kind of championed. Uh, Frankie did a great record probably a couple of years ago now. I'll, I'll Take You There, which is just beautiful. Got all the same element. I'll take you there. I can't say. Okay, but again, Frankie can um, can do little wrong for me. I DJed with him last year, funnily enough, in uh, in Leeds at Leeds Warehouse. Yeah, uh, he's he's a, he's a consummate professional. He's like a DJ's DJ, in a way, because he, he's really committed and uh, also legendary. You don't get many many DJs that that can last, you know, forty years. 
like he's done. So he was playing the um, the baths in uh, in New York, and then gravitated to the uh, to the garage. And to you know to have a career like that and still be making great records, you've got to hand it to him. You know, forty years, long time. Respect you. Um, do you see some parallels between disco and house music? Absolutely, yeah. It's the same thing again. It's almost you tend to see it because I compile albums, right? I'm, I'm kind of quite interested in gener uh, in generational. Uh, things because you, you you tend to find that quite often these things work in cycles. So if you look at the mid '60s, right, the, you know, the particular rhythms dominate over over some over some periods. So if you look at the mid '60s, you have um, the Motown rhythm section, uh, you know, with the Funk Brothers just laying down all those kind of four tops, Icy Brothers, Diana Ross and the Supremes, so all that uptown Detroit sound which was actually kind of up-tempo. If you measure the BPMs on them, they were all like pretty fast. For that generation from the, from the late 60s, I mean, that was, that was what they wanted. They wanted fast, exciting club music, and that's what Motown provided. You jump forward 10 years uh, to the mid 70s, and you've got disco, right, and Philly, which essentially Philly is a more sophisticated, version of Motown, just slightly different rhythms, but still 4-4 four, four on the drums, but you know, sweetened with a lot of strings and vibe effects and everything, but essentially the same tempo. So you've got Motown, um, you've got kind of disco in the mid-70s, mid-80s you've got house, same tempo again. This is now three decades in a row. In the mid-90s you had rave, same tempo again. So I, I, I think Youth generally likes up, up tempo, exciting music. It's it's what you want when you're young, and you've got a lot of energy to burn off, you know. And, and uh, eight to ten hours dancing doesn't seem like a big deal now. I couldn't do eight minutes these days. <laughs> I, also, I have a daughter, and and uh, she's. Um, it's not unusual for her to go out. At, nine o'clock on a Saturday night and return at um, three o'clock on Sunday afternoon. Right, I used to do that, right, and so I can't really moan at her. You know, I, I, I used to be out all weekend and like have my father, it's like, what the hell are you doing? Where are you? Where are you? Where, uh, what are you doing all night? Dancing, mate, dancing. That's what we do when we kids. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, if you think back um, of uh, the 90s um, music scene in England, was, was Take That's We Like My Fire a solo anthem? No. Was it hell? Who told you that? <laughs> the, the original wasn't even a soul anthem. Uh, right, the original was Dan Hartman. Uh, and Dan Hartman was really the, the, the poppier side of disco, right? So um, you got an awful lot of pop acts that rode in on the whole disco thing. Dan Harmon, a very talented guy, but um, you could never you could never really call um, those records kind of not not soul records in my opinion. Right. What was the take that record again? Which we, we like my fire. We, yeah, well well the original had Lolita Holloway on vocals. She's soulful enough, but it always felt a bit poppy for me. It was never one of my it felt like a bit of a sort of kind of gay anthem in a way. It came out around about the same time as the Weather Girls and, mm. and stuff like that. So, um, uh, yeah, it, it was okay. But uh, take that, soul anthem, nah, nah. Okay. How much was Acid House a de democratization of pop music? I don't think you could call it democratization, if that's, if that's the right pronunciation, right? Um, Acid House, I think, started off as an accident. Uh, if I remember rightly, what happened is when they were, um, <clears throat> I think Pierre, DJ Pierre, was, was like the king of Acid House, really. And I'm pretty sure that the first track that he, he, he brought down to the tracks record plan in America, I think they made a mistake with the, um, with the tape. Something happened with the tape and it got slightly stretched 
and all of a sudden you had the the you know the that burbly slightly um, psychedelic sort of synth got even more twisted out of shape but actually sounded really good with a really brutal beat behind it um, so the story I've heard is that actually the tape the tape got stretched it was you know it was some sort of you know malfunction but when they listened to it they're like oh, you know what I kind of like that you know fuck it let's let's just put it out this was instant disposable music you know what I mean so they were, it wasn't like they were polishing and polishing these records for 18 months it was mm, okay I didn't think it would sound like that but it sounds okay and we need a b-side bosh <laughs> right and of course that, like that that kind of the whole imagery of acid house it, it, it was just the right term at the right time because when that record came in uh and I, I believe it was actually called acid tracks anyway i think that was the the uh, the actual original ep um and this coincided with what I was talking about earlier, with the, the whole explosion in these underground clubs. It was very, very cool underground word of mouth scene. And essentially, it was also the explosion of, uh, of E. This is when people were initially really discovering the whole thing. So you can imagine the experience, you know, uh, and, and also the other interesting thing uh, about um, ecstasy is it doesn't really matter about the tune as long as it, as long as it's got a rhythm i mean nobody knows what the hell is is played over 12 hours it all turns into some amorphous you know experience you know you're not going to know you know all 200 records that you might have heard in that time but you know that one with the bubbly synth that acid thing and so all of a sudden it was like mm, crikey okay you know let, let's you had other guys then coming in Thinking, all oh, right, I see what he's done. Okay, let's you know, let's play around. So he had like a guy called Gerald doing Voodoo Ray, and he was in Liverpool, you know, or Manchester. Stroke, came out on Liverpool label, but yeah, there's Gerald in Manchester, uh, who coinced, he he again was right at the beginning, and he brings out a record like um, like Voodoo Ray, which again, spacey, crazy record, uh, and and so in a way, it. it I just think the uh, I don't know about democratized, um, but basically it was just it, it was it was really creativity. It was people left to their own devices. The the technology was affordable, so you know at the time any any aspiring DJ or musician would have a you know an eight oh eight a six oh six a four oh four and a you know early computer system, and of course. You, you could get decent, you know, by house standards, which are fairly simple records in structure, you could, you could get interesting records out, and the market was there. So, you know, you could, you could put out a telephone book with a house beat and probably still sell 15, 20,000. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, and it was, uh, again, Manchester, which was uh, kind of an important place for the SNC, right? Yeah, very important. Yeah, I, I, why Manchester? Manchester's always um, uh, it's always been a good city culturally um, for music uh, and also the audience is is kind of pretty pretty radical in a way it, it, it's a city of a lot of different um, influences um, but in Manchester you, you, you had you had places like the kitchen like Manchester's got a tradition of, you know, like good indigenous DJs, um, which started off really uh, with <coughs> some of the underground clubs, the Reno, which is basically West Indian club in Moss Side, but it will be open all night. Uh, and then you you uh, you had the factory, factory began kind of in the early 80s and didn't really hit its stride until the house music thing kicked in. But Manchester... Uh, at the beginning of all that ha kind of house period was the place to be. And I went up there, in fact, several times round about the time I, you know, the time I took Bam Bam up there. I went up there several times and, you know, any night of the week, you'd have somewhere to go that would be going till six or seven in the morning. You know, they had this place called the Kitchen on Moss Side, which was right in the middle of 
the kind of estate that you don't really want to go. But if you go along with the, the you know, local Manchester guys, you're kind of okay. And they'd be playing like pure acid house at sort of seven o'clock on a, on a Wednesday morning <laughs> where most people are going to work. You know, the, the, these scenes existed. Uh, and Manchester was just pretty good for that. It had lots of, had the playmate on a Wednesday, uh, somewhere else on a Thursday night. Um, Hacienda, I think, had, fr you know, Friday nights. And these were banging nights. And of course, the more nights you got on that are playing that type of music, and you, uh, you had a good set of DJs there as well. Graham Park had come over from uh, from Derby to Manchester, so he was playing the, the, uh, the Hacienda. Um, Greg Wilson was there. I'm trying to think, uh, Mike Pickering, of course. Mike Pickering was the, you know, the DJ that he had. He was, he was instrument, you know, pretty instrumental in, 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 uh, in that. And in fact, made the first um, UK house record, Carino by T. Coy. So uh, uh, there was an awful lot of um, creativity going on in Manchester and you got you go down to these places and there'd be Gerald in one corner there'd be uh, Mike Pickering in another corner you know it was kind of quite an in inclusive scene and everybody kind of knew each other you know and, and uh, it, it, it was great and you go down there and you'd hear stuff that you you wouldn't otherwise hear or, and stuff that people had been messing around with at home so it was quite good that's I keep coming back to this ethos about house was the equivalent of punk. It really was, because it was do-it-yourself. You could be a non-musician, but get the basic rudimentary, okay, yeah, we need a beat. Not much problem there, you know, let's get a nice bubbly bass line to go with it. You know, now let's get some of those farty synth sounds, you know, over the top of it, and boom, you've got a record. And some of those records were good. Was Pickering involved in them, them people? Uh, he was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Clever guy. Clever guy. Uh, right. And um, so he, he was Hacienda DJ. He, uh, he was involved in Deconstruction, the record label, uh, early on, because that's what the Teacot, his record came out on. Um, and then uh, had a lot of commercial success with, um, with M people, who, of course, a lot of their stuff was, was pretty housey anyway, moving on up uh, one night in heaven. You know, and they had uh, vocals which which brought had the small thing in it, right? yeah 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 absolutely absolutely again uh, uh, another Manchester lass so again the, the, you know there were these acts that were coming through that were um, indigenous to the UK that were making making good records like I say it was a brilliant time I think when when you DJ uh, you, you also do house sets don't you yeah um, do you remember any Special moment while playing in a house club. Yeah, that happened during your career. Do you remember? Any yeah, fun, <coughs> funny enough, I mean, there's there's lots of moments when because um, uh, I'm not a very good mixer. Okay, so the one good thing about house is it was fairly easy to mix uh, and not make too many mistakes because it, it's difficult to go wrong with that rhythm. Um, so there's been lots of instances where you have the perfect mix and and it creeps in, but there's one particular time. Um, when I was out with my mates and we, 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 we went to uh, a huge, huge warehouse party in, uh, in the East End of London. This is one of those ones where, you know, the word of mouth went round. They were collecting the money in dustbins, right? They had two or three dustbins full of £10, £20 notes and some big guys, you know, guarding it. And you went in and the sound system was you'd be walking there'd be 2,000 people already there and all in a state of altered consciousness. And so you walk in, it's wow, you know, you can almost feel the, the atmosphere hitting you. And I, I remember being in this place and um, the DJ mixed in uh, a record called Let the Music Move You by the Night Writers. And uh, I just remember that, that that's one of those situations because being a DJ, you don't always listen to things the same way that the crowd does. You're too busy thinking, well, what's he, what's he doing up there? What's he going to bring in next? Oh, God, he should have played so-and-so because that would have... <laughs> yeah, there's all those kind of things that you know, go through. But this one time, I was just going with the flow, and uh, the 
beginning riff of the Night Riders came in. It's just got a really nice nagging keyboard riff and it was very, very, very cleverly mixed. So I kind of knew that it was coming in, but I just couldn't, I couldn't hear the mix, which is what you want to hear when you're a DJ. It's like, whew, boy, that's fantastic. And then what happened is that record's a very climatic record. Again, Frankie Knuckles' production. Um, the way that the chords build in that record and the lyrics, uh, the lyrics is, let the music take you to the top, like that, you know, so it, it, it's what I call a mass euphoria record. If you hear that at four o'clock in the morning and you, you've, you've had an E and you feel at one with the world, it's probably the greatest record you're going to hear. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's just in that place at that time with that whole collective feeling. Another one is, um, is Joe Smooth, Promised Land. You know, um, I, I like uh, Sterling Void, It's All Right. Um, they're, 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 there's an awful lot of good anthemic, um, you know, house records out there. And I particularly like it when there's a good vocalist. So the vocalist with the Night Writers was fantastic, very gospel-y, you know, sort of strong, strong voice there. Um, pushing himself to the limit as well, which is great. So, so that, that was my magic moment, looking around me, hearing this riff come in, which is a nagging kind of keyboard riff, and like, oh, wow, he's done that beautiful. It's got some lovely percussion on it as well. So you're hearing things on so many different levels, you know, and the percussion's tinkering across the time. You say, oh, right, okay, f I've hit it. I'm in the zone. I, don't, I could die now, and I'd be happy. <laughs> Yeah, oh, wow, I can imagine, yeah. Um, so, when we first met in Prostetum, uh, and now being here in <laughs> Germany, what's the difference between these two soul weekenders for you? <coughs> it's an interesting question. The, the, the sociological differences um, between the crowds. Uh, um, in, in the UK basically has been having weekenders since the, the mid 70s. Um, and so there's a, a, there's and there's different types of weekenders. The weekender scene has mutated, all right. And so now you have you have soul weekenders, you know, that similar to this, uh, but tend to there's two different types. There's the more commercial soul weekenders, which I'd say is Caster, where that's probably the most similar to Baltic, where people want to come along. They want to hear, ain't no stopping us now, I found loving, you know, the, the certain anthems that have to be played, thinking of you, Sister Sledge. Um, and it's, it's good time music, but that's really quite commercial, but you do need a lot of people to make the event work. Okay, very similar, if, if, if you look at Baltic, um, and you look at the, the psyche of, of the people, it's quite interesting, the set I just did, um, the, the Germans like certain rhythms, right? Um, and uh, they, they, they quite like the call and response thing. I mean, last year, the Sugar Hill Gang here, and um, it was the perfect audience for them. They came out, wave your hands in the air, shake them like you just don't care. And like 4,000 Germans are, yay, yay, <laughs> like, like that. So it's actually that, that it's, um, it's a great crowd to play to because of the enthusiasm, really. And as long as you play in the right records, you know, um, and <clears throat> they, 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 there's a certain sort of beat. DJ Friction played a few. Dan D will always, always, always play the grabbers, right? The, uh, the set that Dan does tomorrow afternoon uh, will be all the favourites for the Baltic. But you'll, you'll, when, when, when you actually hear his set, you're, <clears throat> there's a certain sort of rhythm there's a certain sort of feel to it, um, and uh, it's, it's probably, I, I'd say in the UK, um, it's, it, it's a bit more diverse, it's, it's, it's a little too commercial for the UK, but for this crowd, fantastic. I mean, you go into that marquee and you watch three and a half thousand people, and they love the acts. You know, the, these American acts must love playing here. You know, because, you know, the audience reaction is phenomenal. Um, whereas in the UK, we're a bit more cynical, you know, <laughs> you know. You know. <laughs> At Caster, I think people turn up 
to have fun, but it, 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 it can quite often turn into a alcohol-soaked booze fest if you're not careful. Some of the other ones are a little bit what I call chin strokery, you know, they, they, they push the musical boundaries, um, but maybe at the expense of atmosphere, you know, because it's, some, of these, uh, some of these weekenders are, are, are too cool for school, we, 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 we say really. Uh, so here it, it's, it's always refreshing. And, and also, the, um, I, I, I personally prefer playing to European audiences um, because they seem more up for anything. You can actually think, oh hell, I'm going to throw this one on. And I do every single time I play here, I'll, I'll select records that I haven't, can't really play anywhere else, but they will actually work here because, you know, the, the, the crowd really seem up for it. I mean, last night, um, well, it was quite a good example. I mean, some guy came out of the crowd and said, you've got any instrumentals? You know, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I've got a few. You won't know them. He said, it doesn't matter, just, just put them on. He's got like a freestyle rap type of thing. And he was good. He was good. So he ended up doing three mini sets. And like, you wouldn't get that kind of thing really happening in the UK. Everybody's, you know, incredibly, uh, 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 you know, takes it very seriously, you know. Over here, it's, uh, it's kind of looser. And you think, oh, crikey, that record would never, in a million years, I wouldn't be able to play it in the UK. Here, I can play it. And then you see the dance floor erupt. You think, mm, oh, I love playing here. Well, okay. <laughs> um, but but the, uh, the audience is, would you say, it's younger here than it was in Pristatin? Yes, yeah. Pr Pristatin is, um, you see, there's, again, that's a Northern Soul weekend. So Pristatin is primarily Northern Soul uh, and what they call Modern Soul and the audience uh, are going to be 50, right? And um, the audience here are probably 30. So there's a 20 year difference, well, I don't know, 10, 20 years difference. Um, and of course the music's, the, uh, you know, the, the music at Pristatin is quite traditional Northern Soul. And so you've got, you, you've got an elder, um, more, uh, how, can, how can I say it, quite, quite opinionated kind of crowd. They know what they like and that's what they want to hear and it's going to be Northern Soul. Right, over here I get the impression that you can almost walk in any of the rooms, you're going to, you're going to see a nice atmosphere, right, and um, probably less, less chin stroking, just people want to have fun. You know, seems like it. Um, actually, what what role does um, Joey Negro plays in the house scene? He was there at the beginning. He he, he was um, Joey used to work in uh, a record shop on uh, Oxford Street called Smithers and Lee, and uh, I used to work at EMI, which was kind of up the road. This was almost like my my local record shop, and um, I became aware of Dave. Uh, simply because he was doing the record buying at this shop and this shop would get interesting records. So, you know, I, I went down there a few times and I thought, hmm, that's interesting. You know, whoever's doing the ordering here really knows what he's doing. And so the first time I met Dave Lee was behind a record shop counter. Uh, and then he, he started doing uh, productions and then licensing in for, uh, for his own record label. And he did a very famous album called The Garage Sound of New York. Uh, and so, again, that was really... Dave came up through that whole kind of era, more, more the sort of New Jersey, Boyd Jarvis, uh, you know, the New York answer to Chicago House in a way. So Dave was really instrumental in that. And he, he, he was, uh, you know, he, he was finding all sorts of records from that area. Turntable Orchestra, You're Gonna Miss Me. It's one that I always sort of remember that Dave was involved in Together Forever, Raven Mays. Um, yeah, so he, he was right there. He kind of put garage music on the map in the UK. I don't, I don't think he'll mind me saying that. <laughs> but, but isn't he kind of the disco? Oh, he's a disco freak. Yeah, he's always been a disco freak. In fact, if I don't, if I hear about a record, 
but I don't know what it is. Dave's one of the first people I'll, I'll ring. Uh, I'll say, what the, the hell is this record? Where's this record come from? And Dave will know it. You know, he, 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 um, uh, he puts out a lot of albums that have got kind of, you know, really obscure disco in. He, uh, and uh, he knows his stuff. There's very, very little uh, in the disco arena that Dave doesn't know about. So, so, you know, you're talking one of the uh, uppermost experts on that kind of thing. And he hangs around with, with all the other guys, the diggers, Sean P, people like that, who, who uh, where they dig these records up from, I don't know. I really don't know. I mean, I've been all over the States buying stuff that I've never seen before. And still these guys are pulling out records I've never heard of. So it's great. It's great. You always need good crate diggers. Do you know uh, by chance where he got his DJ name from? Because I think it's quite a beautiful white face to call. Yeah, it, it, it's it's always one of those dilemmas for me because when it, when he started off, um, I'm like, was it an alter ego? It, it was. I, I, I don't really know why he changed it. Maybe he thought Dave Lee sounds like the guy next door. So I need to reinvent myself. I'm going to call myself Joey Negro, <laughs> right? You know, and maybe did it as a, you know, to get a reaction. Yeah, I'm a white guy, but I happen to be called Negro, you know, like that. Um, it, it's kind of inflammable name. It's a, it's a, so it's a weird one to choose, right? Um, but I don't know, he probably had his reasons.